It's time for Supply Chain Now, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's episode. Greg, how you doing? I'm stoked. <laughs> I'm so excited for this episode, I can't tell you. Um, well, everything I'm talking to everyone on right now came from this place, so I'm not going to give it up yet. <laughs> Please don't. Yeah. Uh, you're still in my yeah, I'll thunder. Let you do it. So we're, we're, we are excited. We're talking with a business leader from the world's leading music technology and instrument retailer. As Greg said, one of his favorite companies. So this is going to be really neat to kind of connect the dots and find out for the first time here on Supply Chain Now the backstory, especially from a supply chain and, and business standpoint. So Greg, we're going to be working really hard to increase our listeners' supply chain IQ today, right? Undoubtedly. <laughs> supply chain and merchandising IQ, apparently. Absolutely. Just a little teaser there. Hey, more to come on that in just a moment. Quick programming note. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to uh, look up Supply Chain Now, wherever you get your podcast from. Subscribe so you don't miss a single thing, including conversations like this. As we welcome in Mr. Phil Rich, Chief Supply Chain Officer and Chief Merchandising Officer, both at Sweetwater. Phil, good afternoon. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Scott and Greg. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We're well, pretty you know, excited too. I had to break in because we were enjoying the pre-show conversation uh, as much as we were, and, and we right. got to get to work and, and capture this for our listeners, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so, all right. So before we talk Sweetwater and, and talk about even your professional journey, let's get to know you a little better, Phil. So tell us, where'd you grow up? And, and let's get an anecdote or two from your upbringing. All right. I grew up in uh, sort of half and half, half in East Tennessee, in, a, in the Tri-Cities area, a little town called Elizabethan, you know, just a plain old little town, all peaceful and quiet. Grew up at the, uh, at the end of the runway there at the local airport where my dad worked. And uh, the other half of my childhood was out in Phoenix, Arizona. Went to middle school, high school out there. Loved, loved the town. Um, really enjoyed it there as well. So I got a, a good blend of sort of east and west. Yeah, no doubt. Love it. So uh, a couple quick follow-up questions. What did your dad do at the airport? So he taught avionics there. There was a, a flight school wow. uh, there. He taught avionics. And one of the fun things about observing him and his, his job there was, you know, when you talk about creativity at work and, so, and finding solutions and, and having a good time doing it, the way he would get to work was fun. He would just, he would just throw his bike over the back fence and uh, walk it up the hill a little bit and just ride down the runway in the mornings. And I thought, <laughs> hey, you know, if you can have fun and get to work and, and it's all safe and good, that, that's kind of a, that's kind of a cool solution. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, bet a, I bet a lot of kids haven't seen their dad leaving for work, dropping a bike over the fence. No. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All awesome. right. So before we uh, kind of transition over to your professional journey, let's talk one critical subject and that's food growing up in east tennessee and then also yeah. in phoenix arizona you know growing up and let's start with tennessee barbecue is the first thing that comes to my mind but it may be something else what did you love growing up oh we had a big garden there and uh uh let's see growing our own corn and strawberries hmm. and and potatoes and stuff and just just kind of growing a lot of your own food and fruits and vegetables and as a family, you know, shucking peas and do all that stuff. That that was just a good time. And so it was really just home cooking was was what I grew up on and enjoyed. Okay. All right. And then you moved to Phoenix and nothing would grow there. So <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So what we were talking uh, to clear audience in there, we were talking just how hot it could be in Phoenix. And Phil, it was it, he it reminded him when he went back, uh, I think later in life, just how hot and, and smothering it is. Um, all right, so let's talk your professional journey, uh, Phil. Let's get, get the, you know, prior to your current role, uh, which is we're going to dive into here momentarily, you know, give us a snapshot of your professional journey, especially any roles that uh, really shaped your worldview. 
shaping a worldview. I think uh, there was a time back in the early 2000s where I was uh, director of training and sales for a competitor of Sweetwater uh, nationwide. And so I had um, a couple dozen people around the country. I visited pretty much every city in the U.S., met every kind of culture and and got to train those people, try to train those people, get their feedback and learn about who they were. Mm. And I would say before that, um, you know, I was in the Navy for eight years, been around the world, uh, you know, was stationed on an aircraft carrier. You talk about a diverse workforce. Uh, I've seen some of your previous uh, podcasts and you talk about that diversity in the military and it's incredible. And back in the early eighties, you know, a lot of uh, folks from other countries were encouraged to join the U.S. military. So a lot of uh, just fantastic cultural experience there for me. I love that. I think yeah. we all could benefit, Greg, from the experience that Phil just just shared in each of those different roles. Um, you know, finding ways of, of, brid, of um, bridging the communities and just getting the mission done. You know, that, that, that's been one of the, my favorite dynamics about global supply chain is despite the cultures and the geographic uh, differences and, and background differences, all that you can put aside, respect, put aside, but just get stuff done. And it creates really strong relationships along the way. Greg, you're quick. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've said this before, when you're in a foxhole with somebody, right, it doesn't matter where they're from or what they look like. <laughs> you're saving one another, right? It's, I mean, you, you're reduced to the core of your humanity, right? And I think if people just experienced other people that way more or thought about it that way more, you know, it would be so much easier just to get together. It'd be a better right? place for sure. Yeah, so no. Phil, uh, one quick follow-up question before Greg. Greg's licking his chops. He, he's looking forward to diving into Sweetwater. Um, but let's, you know, from those experiences you just described, I bet you can write a couple books. But, you know, when you think of the proverbial Eureka moment, what's one of your favorite um, Eureka moments that come to mind? I think one of my favorites is from a, a mentor I had probably 15 years ago, who I, I'm still in touch with this day. And that was, I would, when I'm, I worked for him and I would ask him questions about why things were the way they were. Like, why is this, you know, when you're a hot, hot headed younger guy, right? You're like, why is it this way? Come on, explain this to me. Right. And the Eureka moment was picking up the phone and going through person after person to find my way to the, the person that was the source of that, who actually made the decision, who, decided to do things, the, the, whatever the thing was, to do it that way and to ask them why they did it. And so that developed in me just an incredible curiosity, which is one thing I really look for in hiring people and looking for team members is just, if they just have an incredible curiosity, they can overcome a lot of things they either don't know, they need to learn or, or challenges presented to them by getting down to the source and learning why things are. And so that they can figure out what's the best solution. And that was probably the best Eureka moment ever for me. Love it. All right, Greg. Speak first to understand, right? Yeah. Um, all right. So I have a really important question for you. So you are basically a walking, you're, you're a walking bucket list. So you're a pilot, um, right. correct? And, and a guitar player, That's a right. former Navy vet. You played in uh, the a the band a band in the navy as well absolutely yeah i was i was a guitar player for the navy band for six years yeah and and when when we uh started when we started the the pre-show conversation i noticed a guitar in the background which i don't see right now so i'm guessing that it's in your hands there it is <laughs> yeah. eric johnson fender strat yep. um so what i'd like to ask is probably the most important question we will answer today and that is, can you lay down some of your favorite licks for us? Oh, yeah. We can play a little, you know. Turn it up. All right, that's the East Tennessee <laughs> that's version. The <laughs> <laughs> that's the East Tennessee lick. All right. Anything else you want us to hear? Oh, you know, there's always like the classic bar tunes, like... There you go. <laughs> so 
you are clearly a heck of a lot of fun at a party. So <laughs> can I just yeah. can I just insert the proverbial wow? I mean, Phil, right. just to do that, just like you're tying your shoes and and it, for it to sound just like that. I mean, holy cow, Phil. Oh, thanks. <laughs> a lot of talent. All right, Greg. So, um, so first of all, I'd like you to carry just one message, and that is to my favorite, now probably you'd have to break it to him, second favorite person at Sweetwater, <laughs> Ian Rogels, who is uh, the rep that I worked with to coordinate all of this and frequently hear from, which we'll talk about in a little bit also. Just let him know that we talked, and, and, um, and I appreciate all of his help. But tell us about what Sweetwater does. If there's anyone out there that doesn't know, and there probably aren't a lot outside of the music business, but tell us about Sweetwater and what they do. Well, the broad stroke is Sweetwater is the largest online retailer of musical instruments in the United States. And the definition of musical instruments for us is, is things like this yep. and drum sets and keyboards, uh, all the gear you're using. So microphones and interfaces, uh, drum sets, all that kind of good stuff. And, and that is what we sell. Now, what we do is not what is not what we sell. What we do is we connect with customers. Uh, when you talk about Ian Rogels, his his title is sales engineer, and what go. he and the other 495 sales engineers we have did is when we hire those folks, we put them through three months of classroom training that they have to pass to get to a desk and a phone so they can start selling. And those three months are spent talking about our Sweetwater culture. We're talking about all the technical aspects of everything that we sell, how to connect with people, the seven habits, all these kinds of things to set them up for success, to develop a relationship, to really care about customers and try to solve their problems. And that's really what we wanna do. And along with that, we offer all kinds of other services like uh, free tech support, we're a repair center, we're all kinds of things that differentiate us from everybody else in the industry and and I could just go on and on for a long time about what makes us special but it's really those guys on the phone talking to customers having that relationship that's what makes us special so um, I want you to know Phil that um, th I've had a couple of tech companies and Rod Doherty who is uh, also a fantastic guitar player and keyboard player introduced me to Sweet Sweetwater because he was my, not only my chief product officer at our tech company, but he was also my chief customer support critic. Um, <laughs> impossible, utterly impossible um, to get a, the slightest, slightest flaw in customer support passed. And he just raved about Sweetwater, which is what brought me there. And I understand that that's pretty common. So I'm, and in a second, I want to uh, talk about that, that how you got there. Um, but before you do, first of all, congratulations. And we're going to talk a little bit more about customer experience as part of this, but tell people what your role is. I think it's fascinating having sat kind of in both seats that you have as well, but um, I don't know how you live with yourself. So tell us everyone about what both of your roles are at Sweetwater. All right. So I've been here a little over nine years and originally I came to Sweetwater uh, to be head of merchandising. So for really for the first eight plus years, that's what I've been doing is developing that team, the buying team, uh, planning and forecasting, et cetera, and, and growing that. And then in the last six months or so, uh, that's where the chief supply chain officers come into play. We uh, opened our new distribution center in February. Talk about timing. And <laughs> <laughs> February 17th, yeah. And in March, you know, we sent everybody home for a couple of weeks and uh, a lot of us dove into those processes out there uh, from, you know, receiving, put away, conveyable, whatever, you know, all the things that go on in a DC. And I just fell in love with it and spent all my time back there. Fortunately, I have a fantastic uh, guy to watch over merchandising while I was out there. And uh, so it's everything from uh, onboarding new vendors, vendor relationships, contracts, all that usual stuff you're, you're probably used to, Greg, a lot. And then, and then it's everything down to the pack station and the packers and what's the quality of the experience when the customer opens the box? You know, how are we treating each individual kind of product and what's appropriate for the environment, for the customer, et cetera, and how do we become more efficient? So it's a lot of basic 
stuff, but, uh, you know, but hard to execute sometimes on a big scale. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it is everything, Scott, that we talk about all the time. It is everything from selecting. And in some cases, I don't know if you all do this, Phil, but sometimes helping suppliers design products or mm -hmm. adapt products to what the customer base wants all the way from that. Uh, what, what is Sweetwater going to sell to how are they going to get it from their vendors? And then how are they going to get it to the consumers? So um, it's a, it's a mixture of art and science, which we've talked about before on this show. So it's a really interesting perspective. Agreed. Agreed. Hey, just curious, uh, the new DC, where, where did y'all open that up? It's about uh, two thirds of a mile across a long parking lot from here. So, okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel like I should submit expense reports for mileage between the two because I'm going back and forth, but <laughs> you're getting uh, your steps can, in. I can you get it learn in. from your father, Phil, get a bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, phew, but it wasn't 42 degrees, man. <laughs> right. <on> that bike. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's on our property here. Uh, we own over a hundred acres here. It's on the property. It's 300,000 square foot. Plus, uh, we just opened another 50,000 that we got occupancy of just two weeks ago. So we're moving quickly, uh, preparing for, you know, peak season and, and enjoying it. Yeah. So did you awesome. have a, did you have a different distribution center on that property or was it elsewhere or what? We did. We had, we actually had about 90,000 square feet here attached to the building that I'm in right here. And got it. with our sales force here, our warehouse, our repair center, everything is right here in one place. Boy, the, the, the ability to work together as a team is tremendous. So I, I got to ask you this, uh, considering your role, dual role, what, um, where do you now, or where do you expect you might when your role kind of settles out? Where do you think you will spend your time or where have you enjoyed spending your time as you kind of balance both of these worlds, the art and the science? I'll tell you, I enjoy, I enjoy all the time that I spend in both places. It's, it's really fun. We have a bit of a newer uh, senior staff in the DC. So I spend a lot more time with them uh, since it is a detached building, they get a little bit less of the immediate culture of Sweetwater. So when you talk about who we are and why we make decisions, um, you know, the Sweetwater difference, taking care of customers, that's something that I want to continually put in their minds and continually every decision we make out there, just go back to those fundamentals so that both buildings have a, try to have as much of a matching culture as possible. So I probably spend 70% of my time out there and I'm 30% back here, you know, on helping onboard some of the bigger new vendors and things like that. That that's exactly the opposite of what I would have expected. And what I think you would mostly see is getting out of the office 70% of the time. And that's a really good approach because it, it is difficult when you have a re remote staff, even though it's two thirds of a mile away to communicate all of that. So that's a, that's a great effort. Um, kudos on that. Let's talk a little bit about this culture. So one of the big events I've heard about is actually a customer event, right? Where you invite customers and have kind of a big shindig there at the facility. But, and, and you're welcome to talk about that, but I have a feeling that stems from the general culture of the company. So I'd love to understand not only what you can tell us about this culture, but how did it originate and how do you, how do you continue it? Well, we're fortunate that Chuck Surak, the founder and president of Sweetwater, is here every day working hard alongside of us, you know, and he's been doing it for 41 years. It's really, he has an incredible drive for excellence, an incredible drive for detail. And when you talk about me, uh, you know, being a pilot, musician, whatever, Chuck is a helicopter pilot. He's an outstanding saxophone player. He's in a working band. You know, he's... Uh, He's got his own customers still that call him from way back. You know, wow. he's, he's way into it. And when we do that event, which is called Gear Fest, that's what you're talking about, Gear right. Fest, where we have about 10 to 15,000 people on our campus and all the vendors are here. And it's really just a, like an enormous consumer trade show. He stands at the front door and greets them all, you know, all day long. And that, that's just, th that trickles down as a culture to all of us in, what he does, what he says, and it's now we have 1,800 employees, so we all get it now, and it's our, and we just have to keep it moving along. 
Hey, you know, uh, one of the things that really communicates to me, there's a variety of things, but that authenticity behind the brand, you know, when this, when this founder and senior leader is willing, you know, to not be put in the ivory tower, like a lot of, let's face it, a lot of these brand founders and they separate themselves from the, from the employees and the customers, but to be down there and, and roll up the sleeves and make it about the team members and about the consumers and, and look for those conversations and relationships, that authenticity is, is, is a beautiful thing to hear about. Yeah. And we use a different word uh, that I didn't actually hear a lot before I came to Sweetwater. And that word is credibility. And you have to work hard to gain that credibility with customers mm -hmm. by example. And, you know, when I first came to work here, Chuck said, you know, the senior staff here, they all actually work for a living. Right. And what that really translates to is we can actually go do the jobs of the people that work for us and help to teach them, mentor them, I think at most every level. And that's really an exciting thing when you sit in your small executive group and you can talk at all those levels because you know we're all interacting at those levels. That, that's a really important thing. Look, you know, Scott, to your point, culture comes from the top, whether it's intentional or it's accidental, uh, whatever the culture of the company is always comes from the chucks of the respective businesses. Um, and that that's an important commitment that leaders need to make authenticity, credibility, whatever you want to call it engagement. Clearly, um, Rod as actually told me about walking through the gate at gear fest and, and talking to Chuck on his way in. So it, it, it happens. I mean, that's, you know, and it, and it really cements in the mind of someone who is virtually unpleasable in terms of customer support. <laughs> uh, which drove a lot of strength in customer support in our organization. But um, for him to be that excited uh, got me that excited and then to have experienced it, right? It's one thing to have been told about it, even by somebody who is so discerning, but then to have experienced it and experienced the overperformance in clearly intentional overperformance of Ian and, and the rest of the team at Sweetwater. Uh, it's just really impressive. And, and look, we're talking about people, who do what their customers do. Chuck's got a band, right? He, he can empathize another keyword with, you know, with the people because he understands the joy and the frustration of being in a band and needing a, a product or whatever. So, well, let me ask a question along those lines. Cause Phil, as you shared earlier, you spent six years in the U S Navy band. You might've played in other bands. I imagine given your talent, do you ever think about, your former band mates and their needs and their point of view as you, you know, sit in a chair at Sweetwater now? Absolutely. You know, from the receiving dock to, you know, forecasting and planning out, making sure we have enough guitar strings in stock, you know, so that people can keep, keep playing and, and bring that joy into their lives. And, and one thing we know when, just from being in the industry for so long, when diversity hits the economy, when diversity hits the culture of the of, of our country, people typically turn to two things, <laughs> music and alcohol. <laughs> That's right. And so- And what and, a great mix. Yeah, and music has been, and, and in this case, I think cars has really benefited from the automobile industry, but, but the music industry is so resilient, and that word is popular right now, but the resiliency of the music industry is great because it's so passion driven. People love it so much. And, and that is part of our management team here is, yeah, we have accountants that don't play an instrument, but we have a, so many musicians here that just get it. And, and it just makes it work better. Love that. So that's ironic that the accountants don't play an instrument. It's a very <laughs> mathematical thing, right? Mu being a musician, maybe you could have internal lessons for those that don't play. Uh, we actually, yeah, we actually have a music academy on site. Too. Awesome. About 850 students a week. Wow. That's incredible. If I could do it at work, I'd probably play a lot better guitar. Um, all right, let's go a little bit more broad here. So your perspective is fantastic. Clearly you get um, even the customer experience aspect of this along with merchandising, which is one of the keys to customer experience, you have to evaluate that. And of course, supply chain, which delivers on the customer experience in quite a literal way. So um, 
And that's just one of the big themes that we've been talking about over the last few weeks is customer experience. And I think we've expressed that you all are fantastic at it. But uh, if that, or if something else, what kind of broader base topics are getting mind share from you right now? Definitely logistics. Um, if, if, if I can define that as a broader base topic, lo logistics for sure, uh, keeping tabs on Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, Japan, China, uh, Europe on what factories are running. Um, th there's been a surge in the products that you're using on this podcast. Of uh, course. A massive yeah. surge in that. Um, yeah. So that's really been just a big focus uh, for me. And I think for most of the industry is, is how much can we get produced? What's the, what are the right things to produce? It's a collaborative conversation between us and our vendors, giving them, our, giving back all the information they need to make the right things, giving them better forecasts. And frankly, like all these companies, like the one I'm holding here, I mean, everything that they're making right now mm -hmm. is selling. So the, the better that they can get, the better data that we can give them, the better forecasting we can give them, you know, it's just, it's just great for the industry. The sell through is amazing. So that's really what I'm looking at. People got time on their hands, man. Might as well learn an instrument, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, I hate, I, I want to keep this conversation. There's so many different things I want to ask you about, Phil, but I know we're limited on time. Uh, is there anything now that you're in the music business, so to speak? I mean, you know, being an artist that's now in the business, is there anything that might surprise your average consumer about what, you know, the decisions you make or the topics you that, that are challenging or, or what have you, what's, what's surprising about the business? Um, you know, I think what's, what they would, the outside folks would find surprising is how much the music industry, the products industry is filled with musicians mm. that truly care about their products, that care about how people experience the products um, they would probably be a little surprised about how uh, collaborative the industry is and how much vendors are reaching out to Sweetwater, Sweetwater reaching out to vendors to make better products for them. I think Love that. when you think about, you know, I don't know, Samsung making refrigerators, who knows what kind of processes they use and, and, and focus groups and whatnot, but we're talking to customers, their feedback's really going directly straight back to vendors. And I think that they would probably find that surprising. You know, Greg, um, I've never stopped to think about that, but it makes a ton of sense. And I can, the word that comes to mind is synchronicity, right? And, and, and the vibes, the relationships that Phil was just alluding to. When you combine those two powerful forces together, no wonder the, it's fueling the success of the industry. Greg, what, what did you hear there? Well, first of all, I'm a huge, fan of, of synchronicity, great police album, um, <laughs> and a great word and applies to this. But I think, you know, the thing that you have to recognize about music and why it is such a um, personal experience and why it is so important is because any music is an expression of yourself. I mean, you don't express, express yourself through your refrigerator, but, you know, to give you an example. So it's really, really important. And that feedback is so personal and so engaging. But yeah, what I think is surprising, um, well, I don't know, I, get, I can't say surprising of you, Phil, but what I think is surprising is the incredibly enlightened awakening that, that this company ha exhibits right? I mean, I've said this before. I have said this before, Phil, on our shows is every single retailer needs to examine how you all do retail online or, or in person. Yeah. And they need to mimic it. You are the Nordstrom of the online world. And I would argue that you even exceed Nordstrom and that's a tall order as I'm sure you're aware. So Phil, we're breaking new ground. Greg rarely rarely ever i mean this is a, this is a, a breaking records here but you know i think it is great for industry you know we can all as consumers the three of us and our listeners can probably when you when you think of great deliberate intentional customer service or experience you know, a short list of companies come to mind and, and i think that's really healthy because other companies that have um let's say room to improve 
it, it sets a new bar. That's right? kind. Yeah. Well, you know, we're kind here at Supply Chain now. But Phil, lo, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of hear, get the story behind the story at Sweetwater, get, especially given Greg's personal connections to a great company. So how can, how can our listeners uh, learn more and connect with you and the Sweetwater organization? Well, you can connect with me anytime on LinkedIn. You can email me at phil underscore rich at sweetwater.com. Anytime, we'd be glad to hear from anybody. Awesome. It's just that simple. Greg, you've got a special request, if I'm not mistaken. I would love, yes, I would love it if, Phil, if you wouldn't mind, we've just got a few a minute or two of stuff we need to do. Would you mind playing us out while we wrap this up? Well, you mentioned the, the police, right? Yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. Right on cue. All right, you want me to take it? Do it. Yes, All it. right, Phil, take it. All right, on that on that note, be sure to check out a wide variety of industry thought leadership at supplychainnow.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. And on behalf of Scott Luton and the entire Supply Chain Now team, do good. Wait, sorry, I got to do this. I got to do this right. Do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we out. Supply chain. Thanks, everybody.